Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zinga show with me your host Agassino Zinga and this is episode number 423 that's 423 Cuatro, dos, tres of the Agostino Zinga Show. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Family and friends. Great. Good to know. How am I doing? You know, good. Hanging in there, doing the best I can with the time I have available. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, a download and a share would be much appreciated. And of course, support via Patreon is always more than welcome. As patreon.com for just Agostino, patreon.com for just Agostino to get access to my bonus episodes only available via the Patreon. The first one of the month is going to be dropping at the end of this week. So get involved at patreon.com for just Agostino, patreon.com for just A G O S T I N H O to get involved with the show via Patreon. The first bonus episode props this week. Don't delay, get on Patreon today. Anyway. How is it going, man? Everyone's hanging in there. I hope you are hanging in wherever you are and doing the best you can to keep your mental where it should be. What have I been doing this weekend? Um, bunch of football, of course. Football and MMA have been oh MMA, yeah, the first um fight card of the week or of the of the year, sorry. And um, we're gonna have back to back ones until the end of the month. Um, who did we have? We had Kelvin Katter versus uh Max Holloway for the main event. Um, a great card. One of one of probably the best of recent times. But um, to be honest, they've all been pretty stellar. Um, especially the fight nights. I, I've always felt like the fight nights have always kind of trumped the main um sort of UFC cards because usually the people on there have a lot more to prove. Um, they're they're literally scrapping for their you know for their bread, so that's always great. And in general, anyway, the competition, the rooster, you know, the roster in each weight class um, in the UFC, even flyweights, is just ridiculously stacked. So anyone on there, they could beat anybody. And you know, considering what we're going through in the world, having that distraction of being able to just kind of unwind and watch these elite athletes in their field, um, you know, take to the octagon and just display their skills for us to watch is just great to see. Of course, football as well has been quite awesome. I've watched a tiny bits and pieces of basketball. I've been following some of the drama with um what's his face with the beard and his previous team houston right houston rockets and now he's moved to the brooklyn nets i've been following a bit of that stuff i've been following from a glance of other nfl things so generally the sports has been one of the main things kind of keeping me um somewhat sane in the kind of week-to-week schedule of you know living it under some sort of lockdown of course movies and books have helped as well but sometimes I don't know I found with books especially lately it's kind of made me reflect a lot more than I probably wanted to even though they're pretty good escapism um roots they tend to kind of make you reflect on the good and the bad sometimes make you miss certain things and it can be a bit odd isn't it even movies right movies are the worst especially if they've got a great scene where there's like a group of friends um hanging around or you know long lost love or um something you can relate to with your family interpersonal relationships or something to do with you know work-life balance whatever right whatever that kind of hits or resonate with you you usually find some sort of scene that speaks to you in some regard right on the move in a movie so that's been pretty difficult to do but you know you made the best of it and again there's plenty of distractions out there for you to kind of keep your mind occupied and i think they're necessary honestly do i i think the watching of the news every single day every single hour doesn't really help I think we're in it for the long haul now. We're now what most places in the Western Europe have been under some sort of restrictions for approaching 11 months now. So this is our new reality for now. Obviously, things will change. Um, brighter days will come. But when those brighter days will come, you will know about it, right? You, you'll definitely know when those brighter days will come. It will be something that will be spoken about ad nauseum, um, online, offline, wherever it may be. So you probably do yourself a favor by just unplugging a little bit, stepping away from the computer, stepping away from, no, stepping away from the news. Computer, you can use it to your heart's content. And just, you know, absorbing all that content, man. Why not? Especially if you've been furloughed, try and watch a new series that you haven't checked out before. Maybe check out a couple of documentaries. I've been watching... um there's a three part series on the rise and fall of the third reich that's been pretty awesome to see because i'm a bit of a history buff anyway and i like to have a bit of context as to the times that we're going through nowadays and it always makes me a little bit it helps because it lets me to be i can be somewhat detached and less uh oh, i can be somewhat detached let me see if this works actually i can be somewhat detached and less thin 
I have to plug in my headphones. I should have forgot to plug these in because I'm an absolute dumb dumb. But yeah, well, when I watch these history channel things, it helps me sort of like unplug and unwind a little bit. You know what I mean? So I don't need to be so uh, so triggered by the week's events and all that sort of nonsense because that's always a bit of a waste of time. So let me just double check and make sure my YouTube settings are working as they should be because I decided not to change the settings before I recorded. And as you're listening to this, you'll be wondering, what's he drinking there? I'm drinking a cut, nice hot cup, nice hot mug, sorry, of PG tips with a dash of honey, just to kind of keep myself lubricated and honest, you know? Because well, if you can't be lubricated and honest, what can you actually be? So let's see if the, my clips are playing and the sound's coming through perfectly. Hopefully it is. We uh, gave, you know, this Future Life can Award. I, can people hear that? We gave it. The first time to this guy, Vasily Arkhipov, awesome, you know, awesome, he was awesome, 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 awesome. Everything could be heard there. Great. Anyway, so that's been about it, right? Whilst I've been being, um, hanging out, doing that, watching movies, watching films, and yeah, just trying to keep my head above water, man. Like I said, the books have been great, books have been great, books have been great. So, one thing that I've been thinking about this weekend, actually, something I've kind of come to grips with and sort of come to an acceptance or realization with, especially during this whole lockdown period, has been. My rela my relationship or my attitude towards friendships and relationships, and in terms of just you know, um, not anything uh, romantic, just in terms of with friends and shit, right? And in general, in my life, I've kind of always struggled with keeping friends and relationships, just because I'm a bit of a loner, not because I'm a bad guy. I don't think so. Hopefully not, but I don't count myself to be a bad dude. But usually, because I just don't tend to cultivate or keep relationships i just have a tendency to do that ever ever you know f all throughout my primary school secondary school college university i just never kept in touch with people even though people would kind of go out their way to sort of make it be known that hey i want to be your friend i would never take it to the next level and i don't know why a lot of it has to do with probably some past trauma that i haven't necessarily come to grips with but it will be a tendency i kind of had seen in myself a lot right over the years and there were times where I try to be introspective and be like, I wonder why I do this. Why do I always push people away? Why do I always kind of always want to be on my own? And a really good example and knowledge of it is that, you know, I'm I have it I'm well known within my kind of small group of friends of going out on my own a lot, right? I go to pies, I go to raves, I travel to different countries, like and I do that a lot and I really enjoy it. And a lot of people will sometimes look at me a bit like with a side eye, like, why would you like to go to these places on your own? Isn't it better with friends? And I would always make the excuse of like, Oh no, I don't want to ask people because, you know, it's just it takes too long to get things done. You know, you just you just kinda of try and rationalise your own psychopathy. And looking back at it now at times, I just think I just, there's no real explanation behind it. I just think I've been doing it for so long. I just naturally do enjoy that side of things a lot more than the other side of things. Maybe it's because of a detachment. I kind of want to be left alone. I don't know, whatever, or to get up to some debauchery activities. I don't know what it is, but regardless, I tend to do that quite often. And I think this lockdown has been one of those times where a lot of people have kind of looked inwards and kind of seen if there's relationships and stuff in their life that they could kind of mend and I kind of went through that a little bit towards the end of the year where I reached out to a couple of people about you know that who I obviously I feel in my heart that I kind of wronged a bit or I didn't necessarily I wasn't necessarily the bestest of friends to them and I went to sort of mend things and then I realized I think over the last few weeks having read some books and just kind of you know reflecting on the year gone by and what's to come in the future it's kind of pointless and the reason why I say this, because I, I generally think like as bad as the situation we're going through now, there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel, right? There's some really good numbers coming out in the UK with the terms of the amount of people that are getting vaccinated. Certain countries in the world are opening up. Australia and New Zealand are doing pretty well. Parts of Southeast Asia have got the virus and under some kind of control, right? And, you know, slowly but surely parts of Europe will end up kind of rolling out the vaccine there are. Um, you know, parts of America... If you live in Houston, if you live in Texas and sort of places like that, people just don't really care about the virus. But in general, there is some movement in terms of getting the world back to where it was prior. So I do see a better future, whether it's end of this year or the beginning of 2022, we definitely the end of the light in the tunnel. So with that being said, there's definitely an opportunity and a chance for you to meet loads of amazing new people and have some very fresh and real experiences that you probably wouldn't have had without COVID, right? COVID's probably made people a bit more appreciative and also 
let them maybe be it probably helps them acknowledge how unappreciative they were of their freedoms and the things that they were able to do prior to covid so i think once that's over people are going to be more willing to have real experiences with humans in real life than they were prior so there's so i think if you go around trying to forgive or not trying to forgive if you go around trying to mend every friendship and relationship that you had prior that just fizzled out for whatever reason you don't allow yourself the room to kind of invite new people in and i'm saying that from my point of view where i've kind of been the worst of kind of friends right i've not really been the best in terms of keeping people around who have been there from early anyway do you know what i mean I, I still take them for granted but i think even in my case it's come in my case more so i feel like it comes across a bit uh it comes across a bit fake when i do reach out to these people and be like hey i want a mentor because i don't really mean it right i'm just doing it because i feel like it's the right thing to do so i'd much rather it just mend if it wants to mend and if it doesn't mend it doesn't mend but then my hypocrisy that i have in me is that even though i have a very um laissez-faire don't really give a fuck thing attitude towards friends I'm also very prone to trying really hard to mend something that's quite clearly gone. Like I'll chase, not ch I won't chase, but like I'll keep at people who obviously don't want to be kept at or who possibly feel like you were a friend that they probably had at a specific time of their life and now they've moved on. But I will constantly keep chasing that sort of person in the hopes I can maybe rekindle whatever friendship we had at that time and bring it forward to the present moment. And that note usually always recipe for disaster. And again, it's only friendships. This isn't romantic. If it was romantic, it would be even worse. It would be even way more, um, it would be way more muddied. But it's just, it, it, I tended to do that a lot. And I remember prior, I think it's been helped now because I deleted my Facebook. But when I used to have Facebook, you know, I had like over close to 2,000 friends on there. And most of it was because wherever I traveled on my own, I would just pick up loads of random friends, right? From just like asking people, hey, let me add you on Facebook after we kind of had a chat in the flipping toilets, getting up to whatever, whatever you get up to when you're in Berlin, right? In a techno club somewhere. So you just, you know, you're just giddy and, you know, off your face and you just want to add people and make friends. And you come back home, you have all these new friends that have accepted you and you have like, you know, that kind of like... um you have that kind of uh what's that what's that thing called that honeymoon period of like two weeks where you're exchanging tracks you're talking and then of course you know because you live miles and miles away the relationship kind of pairs up but then you go back again the next year and you try and rekindle it and obviously things have changed i don't know that person might not be into the music anymore they might have moved to another country they might have got a new job i don't know whatever something just changed and you know they're not going to wait for your friendship um it's just not realistic and i'll be like a bit bummed but then I'll try and keep chasing. It just wouldn't work out too much. So there's that two, there's those two sides of my personality, right? Where I don't give a fuck and I try and keep people away as much as possible. And I also end up chasing randoms, like people who I don't even know that well, right? Or even people I do know well who clearly have moved on. It's just an odd part. It's just an odd place to be. So I think during lockdown, one thing I've realized is that it's best just to leave things as they are and where they are if they end up mending themselves fair enough but i think we're all going through whatever we're going through at the moment and this probably isn't the time to try to kind of understand or psychoanalyze people and to try and mend things because i think that requires a lot more time and effort um and it just mostly time for it to heal right you, you know, they always say um time always heals old wounds so if that's the case you're just gonna need more time for it to kind of heal because right now people are so sort of preoccupied with making sure we have food on our tables a roof over our heads our friends are okay our family members are safe like we're just trying to make sure our close circle and the things that are near near us are where they should be that all this other stuff about people else people that kind of exist outside of your home just doesn't matter anymore do you know what I mean because we're all sort of quarantined and under some sort of lockdown so the last thing you need to be stressing about is what he or she is getting up to it just doesn't matter at the moment so that's kind of where I'm, I'm at but I'm also thinking that going forward anyway I just would rather have the room open in my sort of like mental friendship hard drive for other people to come in once the world does reopen because I'm sure once the world does reopen there's going to be a, a, such an opportunity for you to meet some great amazing people that you would have probably never met prior but you need to kind of have gone through this sort of like weird um enforced friendship 
cleansing, right? Friendless cleansing somewhere. Like for instance, I, I did it physically by deleting my Facebook because I felt like that was the last or one of the only places that I had that kind of weird tie with. Every other platform I hardly even use Instagram or my Twitter in that way. I just, you know, whatever, I just do what I do on there and kind of leave, post and dump. But I felt like my Facebook was the last, because again, I had Facebook when I went to uni, when it first started, right? And it was the only platform that I used to kind of connect with my friends that I had in sixth form or before I went to uni and some people that I had in my campus, you know, that kind of thing. So it had a different sort of tie to it. And then when I started traveling to like places in Southeast Asia, Central America, going to parts of Europe, it was a great way to kind of hold have a kind of a contact list of all these people that you met all over the world as you traveled and shit but as time goes on you quite you realize you know sooner rather you realize as you as time goes on sorry that you didn't even speak to those people in like years you know i mean you've added them in like 20 in 2011 you know and now it's, it's, it's whatever year it is and you've not spoken to them ever so there's no point of keeping them even in your mental hard drive even if it's just on your facebook it just doesn't make any sense so physically deleting that really helped going a long way but i do think going forward i'm just not going to bother trying to mend any of those relationships or friendships that have sort of like fizzled out i think if they do get mended they will by themselves get mended over time that's the hope but if not i'm also kind of ready and willing kind of semi-open armed i'm still kind of keeping people away because that's just the way i am i like to kind of do things on my own but i'm more kind of open to having the possibility to inviting other people into my life when the world reopens because i'm sure that will end up happening but yeah that's what i've kind of been thinking again this is all from reading books so that's why sometimes the whole reading book thing can be great it can be a great sort of um um it, it can be a great display of mental of kind of intellectual masturbation right showing people oh look look at the books i read i'm a big uh, i've got a big brain but pe what people don't understand is that when you're reading two or three hours per day sometimes four about you know from some of the best authors in the world some amazing novels non-fiction fiction books and then you're just you know it just kind of always makes you your mind wander and when your mind wanders, especially during these times where there's nowhere to your mind to go except for kind of a reminder of the flipping the dread of living in these four walls day in day out it can get a bit weird but introspection is good in it it's good to always sort of like look within and sort of like men and things before you then step out into the outside world and people don't do that often enough in it people are often too quick to jump outside and try and solve the problems of the world whilst they've got an internal volcano erupting ferociously over you know all the lava is pouring out from every orifice of their flipping body but yet here they are telling people how to do x y and z it's always it's always bizarre to me but you know humans are weird like that but yeah that's been my weekend revelation so what can you do what can you do but on brighter news covid is coming down in some regard in the uk look at this headline pretty good in it right covid being brought under control as uk is smashing vaccine target says matt hancock and i think he actually used the phrase smashing vaccine target which is very very encouraging because these politicians love to especially now right because i think they overcooked a few promises so they're trying their best to make sure if it's good news it's good news if it isn't keep it stum. so this is courtesy of itv news it says the following covid19 is being brought under control in the uk the health minister has said suggesting that the lockdown restrictions are having an impact on various transmissions um in an optimistic press conference matt hancock said the government is smashing the target of vaccinating the four groups considered the most vulnerable by february 15 which is great he said that four million over 4.4 million people in the uk have had at least one dose of covid vaccine vaccine um including more than half of the over 80 to half of those in care homes the government is aiming to vaccinate 13.9 people considering most vulnerable by mid-february with the hope that it could begin to ease lockdown restrictions around two weeks later that is flipping great news but national director of nhs uh, professor stephen powers cautioned it was some time before the vaccination levels mean restrictions can be eased of course doctors say that of course but then that's a great balancing of, of politicians having to balance like um scientific demands and needs with the needs of the economy and just the well-being of your populace and because 
God damn it, man. I'm at my edge, at my edge. It continues here. It said, he said the NHS remains under extreme pressure more than ever seen before, more than seen before, more than ever seen before, sorry, with around 15,000 people having been admitted to hospitals with coronavirus since Christmas Eve. There was 599 deaths recorded in the UK as of 9am on Monday, Ms. Hancock said, adding some new, um, someone with coronavirus is now admitted to hospital every 30 seconds. That's grim, but again, positive and negative news. He urged people to stick with the regulations as the program continued to roll out don't blow don't blow it now we're on the route out we're protecting the most vulnerable we are getting the virus under control um talk together i know we can do what we what we we can do it and we have to stick together professor powers said it's absolutely critical that we continue to stick to these social distancing rules that are in place that we can uh, rely yet on vaccine we can't rely yet on vaccines coming to our rescue we'll uh, it will be some time before the effects of the vaccination program can be seen for reducing the pressure on hospitals, um, we have a role to play in reducing the risk of transmission. The health secretary claimed Britain is vaccinating more than double the rate per person per day than any other European Europe. And as he welcomed the rollout of the jabs in seventies, which began on Monday. So again, good news. And like I mentioned previously about my conversation with my friends and stuff, there is light in the tunnel in it. It doesn't seem like it now, but definitely if you just hold on, hold on tight, we shall get through the other side. What else happened? Oh, so United played. United drew Nuno with Liverpool. Big game, big game, big game. Um, obviously, uh, bitter rivals, right? Most of you are aware of this. I'm pretty sure of the rivalry that exists and just what was at stake. Um, what can I say about the game in general? I thought, looking back on it, of course, at the time, I was bitterly disappointed. I think Liverpool were definitely there for the taking. You know, two of their first team, or first choice uh, centre backs were out, so they're having to play Fabinho, who's obviously a pretty decent centre back, um, far better centre back than people probably had imagined, being a defensive midfielder alongside Jordan Henderson, and that obviously then led to their backline not being as high as they probably would have been with proper centre backs. It meant that Robertson and Trent Alexander-Arnold, Trent Alexander-Arnold were most of the time uh, attacking from very deep or crossing it from very deep or deeper than they usually do Robertson had some a couple of flurries down the left hand side where he got to the byline but there wasn't a lot of that that you usually see from Liverpool's play so um there was obviously an opportunity for us to take advantage of it but we started off in the wrong foot a little bit it seemed like um the selection of course with Lindelof playing um partnering Maguire at the back instead of Bailly who's been great the last three games he's played I think this is just another indication that for whatever reason, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer thinks Lindelof is a better defender than Eric Bay, which a lot of our fan base do not agree with. I'm one of them. I think Lindelof has some qualities, but a lot of his qualities are probably strength. And when he's playing in a back three, I think playing in a traditional back two, especially with a defender as slow and as immobile as Eric, um, sorry, as Harry Maguire, it doesn't necessarily help him. If he's playing with a Bay, that'll probably help. But again, Bay is probably a bit too rash for him. But I think Bay and Maguire have the perfect balance because Bay has that aggression and that rashness in him that you sort of want in a more physical defender. And then Maguire is obviously slower, but also then has the calmness and the aerial high and ability and strength from all that malarkey to be a good sort of yin and yang for him. But, you know, for every reason, all you got Shark thinks um, Lindelof is a better choice and to be honest we, there wasn't much of a d difference really there was a couple of occasions where Lindelof got spun but you know you could just say it was probably the quality of the opponent he was coming under he was always going to have a, 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 an occasion in a game where he's going to get dribbled by but I thought for the large parts they, they sort of controlled the game pretty well both of them in Harry Maguire and Lindelof and the fact that I'm praising the defenders and I'm kind of marveling at the fact that Fab Fabinho and Henderson did pretty well against our strikers probably tells you everything you need to know about the match. Um, one only, I guess, clear cut chance Pogba had um, in the game, which he probably should have finished, even though, you know, he is, he's, even though he was playing against a very good keeper in Allison, I think that Pogba on another day should have probably gone for the corners or gone very low to score, but instead he just smashed it directly at Allison. He's probably aiming for power to kind of go through him, but unfortunately it just happened to kind of go directly to his chest and he saved it pretty easily. And then, of course, we had a Bruno Fernandes free kick that went a bit wide that was quite close. Bruno Fernandes himself had an absolute stinker alongside Rashford. He probably was one, two, they probably were two of our worst attacking players, maybe followed by 
Martial maybe, but I thought he did pretty well. He had a, a couple of good runs. Um, Rashford is an odd one, really, for me personally, because he seems to have all the numbers. But when you watch him in the game, it doesn't necessarily marry up. Like you don't, he doesn't look like his numbers, if it makes any sense. Um, he's very like somewhat brain dead when he hasn't got when he's got time to do something on the ball. Um, he doesn't seem to have like a textbook. Does this make any sense? He doesn't have a textbook way of attacking. Remember before he did this thing where on the left he'd cut in and smash the ball in either corner. He doesn't do that too often anymore. So he doesn't have a signature point of attack. He seems to score a lot of goals that he probably shouldn't score. Um, but then the goals he should score, he doesn't. Um, and just in general, in play, he's just... I don't know, he's going for a bit of a bad spell, but he's still getting a number. So that's the odd thing about him. I think even the previous game, he was having a stinker and then he basically gave the assist to Pogba, I'm pretty sure. I forgot what game that was, right? So he's having a weird one. Bruno Fernandes is another interesting character in the Man United fan base because he just seems to be... Um, he just seems to be beyond reproach. Like, if you mention his name in any sort of slight, the fan base goes absolutely crazy. I guess it's because he's been one of the only recent signings so far who've kind of demonstrated who've kind of given the fans an impression or an illusion of what we once were right because he's a kind of quality player that's coming in demanding loads from the other's teammates talking about trophies so that sort of stuff is infectious to our fan base that's so used to us winning and obviously we've been a long time without winning the Premier League so maybe that's the fact of it. I don't know what it is but wherever it is it's really strange that you can't really criticize um, Bruno Fernandes in certain circles but I've always bit of the assumption the feeling that he does he is quite wasteful in possession he doesn't play like a midfielder enough for me I don't know if that's because he's that's just how he is or because the manager is giving him free reign to do what he wants but he doesn't look after the ball well enough in the same way like I don't know bad example but like a Jack Grealish right he looks after the ball he wins fouls he holds possession he brings players into the game moves it around of course if he needs to dribble past seven people he'll do it right but he does just hold onto the ball and, and Bruno Fernandes for me I feel like doesn't hold onto the ball well enough he's always looking for that that one pass sort of like Hollywood ball he was doing little headers flick around the corner things that weren't going off and again all this stuff is high risk high reward um I get it but there needs to be an understanding of like if you're playing it maybe against a higher level of opposition like in Liverpool giving the ball away like that isn't advantageous because they could just pick up the ball a couple of passes already in our box and they get a shot on target do you know what I mean that that's that's the difference between playing someone like them and playing maybe a Brighton so you'd imagine you'd hope that he'd be able to temper it somewhere he doesn't temper it so I think it might be just the coach telling him this and I think I remember um, I mentioned it somewhere else but he kind of reminds me a lot like I said previously somebody but he kind of got angry about it he reminds me a lot of Manish um the ex-porter and you know and briefly into Milan midfielder and also obviously Portugal uh, midfielder I think he might played in that Portugal team that um, Ronaldo played in when Ronaldo got Rooney sent off I think he was there but he's kind of got the similar attributes as uh, Bruno right the sort of Hollywood balls the shots from distance um, he kind of has a same sort of way of passing the ball and even his mannerisms are quite similar but I felt as if Manish looked after the ball better and Bruno just doesn't even though Bruno might end up being a far better player than Manish and you know he might have a high ceiling he just needs to play more like a midfielder more like a classic number 10 number 10s before in the maybe it's just the way football's evolved but number 10s in the past used to hold onto the ball right they used to just be manipulators like in this sort of like a David Silva one matter maybe a Chelsea kind of way where they used to just look after the ball Ozil you know um, in his come first couple of seasons at Arsenal maybe his, his first couple of seasons at Real Madrid and maybe this is just an, an evolution of it that I'm not really familiar with but that was a bit concerning um, but again score draw I mean um uh, no, 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 score draw. No, no, not a bad result for us, all things considered. We're still top of the league. We obviously um, didn't lay a marker down, which is the only sort of upsetting thing. I think, considering Liverpool's lineup, it would have been a good psychological beating for them to have lost at home to us, who, you know, obviously us being first. But I still think, in terms of the long term, this might be our route to winning a league. I don't think we can win the league personally. I just don't think we have them, not to, not to be mean to him because he's doing a good job now, but I just don't see, I've never seen a league champion, especially in a competitive league like Premier League. There's never been a team that's won it with a 
manager that people don't really rate that highly Ranieri of course a list that people can say where they want but he's still got pedigree he's he'd been uh, you know a host of European clubs won a host of trophies and just you know is a fairly competent coach I think Solskjaer has not really proven much in his 11 10 year period as being a coach of course um, two Premier League titles at Norwegian League is probably as good as winning two titles in the Scottish League really do you know what I mean like but he did it don't get me wrong but still you don't really get the feeling that he's the coach that can take us to the next level, right? You feel like he's a great coach for, you know, establishing us, establishing us as a top four, even sometimes a top three Premier League side or even top two, sorry, which is amazing. But something just telling me that the mistakes he makes in terms of selections, in terms of substitutions, in terms of tactics, in terms of sometimes formations, like for instance, like this game against Liverpool, Bruno Fernandes was obviously having a terrible game. We need the people to look after the ball and he doesn't, swap Bruno Fernandes for Van der Beek or for I don't know why matter whoever it was was on the bench right who was even on the bench maybe not why matter but um we had obviously uh a midfield free yeah I guess of Fred McTominay and Bruno Fernandes I say McTominay and Fred worked to some degree I'm still not a fan of that double pivot I think we need to get a defensive midfielder who just sit down his own because we end up losing a spot to one person because we have to split the role between two um so that would obviously maybe go to a Van Van der Beek if we had a actual DM then maybe Van der Beek would play who knows right um um, oh, sorry, maybe you'd give him more opportunity to play in the future. So the substitutes we had, we had Van der Beek. So we had Tawanz Abi, Van der Beek, Matis, Tellers, Henderson, Matis. Yeah, so the weird thing is that I don't understand why when Fernandez has a terrible game, why someone like a one matter or maybe a Van der Beek doesn't come on to replace him because they're like for like-ish type players, right? You'd imagine Van der Beek and one matter are probably challenging for Pogba and Bruno Fernandez's position, but they never happens. And it's always like a odd sub. Like for this one, it was like Greenwood came on instead. That's the thing that's just a bit puzzling. So I think when he does those kind of things, it just makes me think he doesn't necessarily, that's what a top coach would do, right? They'll just change things in different ways. They would kind of maybe, you know, I don't know. There's just something that makes me think that we don't win the league that way. But again, if we do win the league, I think a, a real clever tactics, I think this might be the most lowest uh, points tally for league champions, maybe in a long, long time. It might even be in the high 80s, right? Um, if that does happen, I think how it will happen is that we'll probably end up Draw, we'll probably end up drawing more than we win games against the top six, but then winning more than we lose games against the no, drawing more than we lose against games of the top six, and then winning more than we draw up against teams outside the top six. I think you can still win the Premier League that way. In years gone by, so as Ferguson always used to say, the only way to win the Premier League is to make sure you beat your rivals because you can't, uh, you know, you can't kind of. Uh, guess or estimate for like Everton coming to Old Trafford and you know knocking fire past you because they've turned into flipping Brazil 77 do you know what I mean they tend to do that sometimes these smaller teams so so I suppose always say try and always beat your rivals because it's a psychological blow and you could always guarantee and, and it's like you can you, you can't guarantee the other points but if you have good momentum beating your rivals there's maybe some momentum you can carry on beating the smaller sides so that could be a solution right where we just flip it on its head and we just try and say hey let's not get beat in these big games and then try and win the games outside the top six and then we can maybe sneak it that way and that would be just you know that would be a turn off of the books in that regard so again no no against liverpool decent game all round Man, the match was probably Luke Shaw. He's he's been incredible this season, man. He's been really, really good, um, especially considering how crap he's been prior, right? And that's something that people are willing to rewrite history on. But Luke Shaw was terrible for a good four years, maybe three at United. Most of it was because of his own sort of lack of discipline, uh, lack of kind of hunger. He would always kind of hesitate to run forward. He didn't really overlap. Um, he didn't really offer any overlapping runs. He'd always pass the ball square whenever he was further up the pitch. He just looked, he was just infuriating in just the way he was playing because you knew his ability and his talent level, but he never seemed to kind of have the hunger to push forward. And I just imagine just kind of wither out and kind of die or get moved on to another club, but he stuck it out. Um, he survived the whole host of managers actually considering um his you know um his him not really reaching his heights and then suddenly we sign a brazilian left back in tellers who was the captain of porto 
right? A very competitive league in the Portu- in Portugal, in, in a team that's kind of stacked and stocked with flipping fully fledged internationals from all over the world. Um, of course, it's just because they're all over the world, but you know what I mean, right? Top class footballers, this Teles guy is the captain of that club, takes all the takes all the set pieces, plays game in game out. Um, he comes into the club and then, of course, all of a sudden, Luke Shaw is playing out of his skin. It's no surprise. So all these years, what Luke Shaw actually needed was competition for him to pull his finger out of his ass or to, for him to put the donuts down. And I'm happy to see it. I've got to be honest. I'm happy to see him playing well, but I don't like this whole rewriting of history that he was always good. He wasn't always good. Even when he won Premier League, that play of the season that season, he didn't deserve it, right? He just got it because he was probably the, the only choice that probably sort of, because he could have get got, he was probably the only choice at that year that was probably gonna cause a less least amount of upset with the fans online or whatever it may be but i'm glad to see him performing well now pushing forward and to be honest his levels at the moment are you know uh he, there's not much difference between him and ben chiwa a lot of people won't probably agree with it but i think you know he might not be the flavor of the week or month of the season at the moment but he's playing really really well so that again goes to show how probably shit the game was that i'm crediting a left back with being the best player on the pitch in it but hey, what can you do? What can you do? Next on this, what else do we have here? Yeah, we have an article from The Guardian. Mm. Get rid of this. I've got all these pop ups coming up on my thing, man. It's annoying. But anyway, article here from The Guardian, courtesy Kerr. Well, yeah, what I've been watching, right? So i've been watching um this documentary i did watch this documentary on netflix called crack it's really really good there's a obviously a little review here on the guardian but essentially it speaks about the crack academic that kind of you know swooped um, all across america they kind of highlight a lot of the story sort of touch points come from new york mainly but essentially talking about the crack epidemic in a you know in the 1980s and how that affected politics and um socioeconomic stuff and obviously issues with race and war bloody blah 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 but it's so well done very well put together an easy easy watch about an hour 20 minutes if that um loads of interesting people kind of speaking on it loads of kind of all cool talking heads um but the most disheartening part of it is obviously the conversations that have been had with uh former crack addicts who are now kind of you know in recovery who are basically speaking about the damage that that drug did to their lives and obviously their families and the fact that well one lady in the documentary she's missing a few teeth and she looks really really gone and then you see a picture an image of her when she was younger with her two daughters and she's talking about how she basically left lost them and you know, through the drug you know obviously going through various stages of turmoil um you know just loads of in in a in a family strife and she's just basically alone in this studio talking about how hard her life has been it just really hits you man of how devastating um the crack academic the crack epidemic was um in america during that time and it's really really eye-opening um and again the, it's just funny to see how naive or how kind of blissfully unaware or unwilling they were to be aware of the actual issue that was going on especially with the government right and um, when it comes to dealing with the crack epidemic and they decided to have this you know initiative with the just say no right i think that was ronald reagan's wife initiative and they legitimately thought that that was going to be that was going to do it they even they even recorded like a song with loads of well-known celebrities like a jingle thing they did adverse with of course well-known actresses and actors during the time and it's just mind-boggling to think that at that time they thought that would be the thing to end the crack epidemic in any sort of like you know substantial way and this is obviously after the fact that they kind of painted it as a black problem they painted it as a thing where you know um black mothers were giving birth to crack babies they painted it as a you know a degrading drug that kind of brought out the worst in people but then they weren't they weren't demonizing cocaine in the same way that was kind of indulged by the more affluent upper class fairer skin type people in america it's a really really good documentary i really recommend you check it out um this obviously a review here from um netflix it says the war on drugs founded by policing 
uh, behind Netflix documentary about crack. It says in a myth uh, busting new film director Stanley Nelson looks back at the crack epidemic in 1980s. It says here um, nestled in jungle fever, Spike Lee's um, meditation on the interracial love in a harrowing depiction of how the crack consumer corrupts in a supporting role. Samuel Jackson plays Gator, a man who ferociously possessed by the drug that he at one point storms his own mother's home and runs off with a television set which he sells to fuel his addiction. Later we find him in a Taj Mahal, a Harlem crack house that looks like a um that looks like Hades, surreal, decept uh, de decrepit and filled with hundreds of lost souls. References to the crack epidemic have swept the United States in the eighties and the nineties are not lacking in pop culture. Though hardly are we given the kind of sweeping portraits that the uh, situ distributing so disturbing and outrageous individual stories like gators within a broader social and political trajectory crack cocaine corruption and conspiracy the latest documentary by stanley nelson uh, provides just that weaving personal testimony with former dealers users with insights from historians scientists and other experts crack provides a history of one of the nation's greatest failures one whose ripple effects remain a large part of today and i recommend you check it out i really do it's really good and it's funny because it got me thinking i was watching it. i was like what it basically means like ethically ethically and morally if you're vegan you can't really take any class a drugs can you you can't do care you can't do coke you can't do meth whatever you can't do nothing really apart from smoke weed if you're legitimately um a vegan and you live that lifestyle because you can't deny the blood that's on your hands when you're inhaling those kind of class a substances there's no way that you can kind of distance yourself from it at some point um along the journey of that drug getting from you know uh origin to you it's definitely had some blood trickle down the side of it for sure um that was kind of one of those kind of things that got for me and of course because i think there was a few interviews on there actually with former dealers who have obviously you know felt like they had a lot of karmic responsibility karmic um consequences coming their way for the strife that they caused obviously during the years some were not so repentant who kind of saw it as a way to boast but for the most part it's pretty harrowing it's not as bleak as i'm making it seem but i recommend you definitely check it out it's a raising amazing amazing documentary uh like i said what's it called crack cocaine corruption and conspiracy available now on netflix <clears throat> we'll also have here another review of a show that i liked or that i love that i've actually finished the entire season of spiral on bbc iplayer it's i think available on other platforms regardless of where you are in the world but god damn it quite possibly one of the best if not the best cop drama of all time and i put and i stand on that i really do and now again i watched the wire um i've watched uh, the bill in the uk we have here i've watched the shield right um, spiral is the best and if you don't know spiral spiral um the english name uh, french name is engrenage it's a french uh or parisian based cop drama um it's amazing if you if especially if you're non-european it definitely gives you a bit of an insight into the strife and the struggles of inner city life within a european city that you're probably not familiar with from racial tensions economic um disparity classism um just loads of really cool perspectives that you get from just a cop drama because imagine how many people because this is what you forget with that's why i love cop dramas because for the most part they get to see the 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 kind of the glitz and the glamour of whatever city that they're in and also the underworld right so you get to see both sides in real time and they have a and it's kind of coming from so many different perspectives like you know there's people working in a police force who have obviously been grandfathered in people with from affluent means people that don't have any other option so you get all that kind of internal struggle within the police force itself and then of course when they go and interact with the wider community it's just you know an entire cacophony of just you know psycho perhaps trying to make sure they don't shoot each other down but engrenage is really really good um i'm a big fan of it mostly because of the obviously the european connection obviously because of the cd kind of um underground uh organized crime side of things as well right the fact that you know uh, for, for, for as much security and regulations and red tape that surrounds the import and exports of certain things we they always seem to cross our shores in some underhand way and most of it has to do with the 
just a kind of complex web of criminality that seems to have seeped through major parts of um, Western Europe. But I really, really recommend check it out, man. And, and the protagonist in it, the, what I guess the main kind of lady, um, Caroline Proust here, who plays, um, what's her name? I forgot her name in it. But yeah, she's really good. It's an incredible, incredible series. If anything, this is maybe the best example of what Michael Burnham in Star Trek Discovery should have been. You know, Michael Burnham, so I just, I've stopped watching it, right? After I think whatever, season three, it just got ridiculous. She disobeys every single order. She does what she wants. She kind of flies off the seat of her pants. You know, she doesn't get punished for her action. She's no consequences to it. She always saves the day. Everyone always has a way for her. It's just, in the, it's just stupid. But with this series, she's probably the, I've got what her name is in here. Um, What's her name? Prowse, is it? Jolene? Jolene? I forgot her name. It doesn't matter anyway. But this character in, in I'm Gonna Know Spiral, she, they kind of portray her perfectly because she's just um, broken, right? And whatever trying healing that she's trying to get through her job, she never finds it. Whatever trying love and affection she tries to find from people within her workplace, also she doesn't get it. She then ends up in an completely toxic relationship towards the end of the season when I'm not going to spoil anything, but she ends up in a very toxic relationship towards the end where it kind of essentially takes them both down in a in a kind of, in a way. Um, but there's always like along the way of watching this show there's always points where you just feel like it's all gonna go away she's just gonna crumble and die something tries gonna happen to her and of course it doesn't but in terms of just there's always that kind of feeling that it might happen whereas in Star Trek Discovery you never ever get the feeling that Michael Burnham is ever gonna be in trouble for anything right or she's ever in danger and you're sort of complete opposite obviously with Don Grenage so this is from New York Times read a bit of the review here they said courtesy of mike hale he says the long-running crime drama spiral is french title where it premiered at canal plus back in 2005 called engrenage or gears does not take place in a postcard paris oh yeah that's another part of it too paris i've been there twice right um first time would obviously on my own first time wasn't that great um i kind of didn't have a connect and I kind of didn't really see the hype of Paris. It kind of felt a bit stuffy, a little bit well to do. And then the second time I went, obviously, for Virgil's fashion show for Off White, that might have been 2017 or something. I forgot when it was. And um, that was great because I obviously got the red card treatment. I was going to go to a fashion show. I was working on something with him at that time, doing an online course for Master, the previous company I was at. And then I got to see a completely different side of Paris, right? I got to see it in how it's actually meant to be experienced with locals, with people sharing you around places, you know, going behind velvet ropes, secret doors, um, underground bars, um, you know, lock-ins, all this sort of stuff. That's the, how you're kind of meant to experience it, right? Walking around the city for an hour's on end, looking for people to hang out with, like that was actually how you're meant to experience it. I was like, oh, amazing. But then watching a the show, you get an entirely different idea of it too, because they film a lot of it sometimes within the outer rings where most of the sort of immigrants Grant community are based in it's just eye-opening it's incredible it's incredible um Torres and it continues here Torres and landmark picturesque boulevards are scant the eiffel tower occasionally appears in the hazy distance like a mirage the show's eighth and final season begins with a shot of the sacre or the sacre cour how do you pronounce that but the camera pans down to the working class barbers district where the dead body of a homeless moroccan teenager is found inside a laundrette so again they always start the season usually with a striking image and that first episode of season eight is quite possibly one of the best at the best representations of why Angrenage is amazing if i'm not mistaken there's like a middle eastern kind of dude walking down the street carrying a box going to work doing whatever as he's crossing the road a group of teenagers you know quickly zip by him on an electric scooter and if you've been to paris you know everybody rides those e-scooters right lying wherever they're from they're so popular they're everywhere so you see him kind of nearly getting run over by someone on the scooter um he crosses the road and then you see a really great car you see the cobbled streets of course and then as he's crossing to come over to his laundrette there's a contrast between a really amazing pearly kind of yellowy stone building and then he's sort of like spray painted um you know iron uh steel sheet kind of laundrette before he's kind of crossing over so you get that contrast and it's like a snapshot it's like maybe it's five minutes max that scene but it's a perfect encapsulation of why on grenade is absolutely amazing i definitely am, uh, encourage you to check it out man it's probably one of my again one of the best cop dramas of all time 
including English language. Trust me, I've watched them more. Um, too many to mention. But like I said, it's better than The Wire. No, it's not better. It's not better than The Wire, sorry. It's better than The Shield. Um, it's probably up there with The Wire. But again, if you're into cop dramas, check out Ungrenage Spiral, available on all streaming platforms for you to check out. Mm -hmm. What else is here to watch? Do, 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 do. Okay, yeah, this is a good one. So, um, I'm not sure if you guys remember, but there was this article that came out uh, maybe a few weeks ago, maybe, no, not a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago, when obviously COVID was still raging in parts of Europe, more so than it was in Southeast Asia. And uh, the Thailand Gov the Thailand Tourism Board basically put out this amazing editorial basically saying that, hey, if you want to, we're basically opening up um, Thailand to um, foreigners to come and basically work remotely in it because obviously the world has changed post COVID. People are now, you know, more able to work from home. Companies are more willing to let their employees work remotely completely going forward. Loads of big tech companies are basically closing their offices and moving to more remote working um, schedule, which is allowing their employees to go work wherever they need to be. And a Thailand tourism board for is a good opportunity to sort of slip in and say, hey, we're open for business, come here and work from the beach. Um, and of course to bolster their tourism and get people out there because you know no one's there now because for the most part most countries are you know um, or most places that you kind of fly into Thailand have obviously that mandatory quarantine thing so doesn't make the whole thing worthwhile but it looks like it hasn't worked this is a little roundup video from Bloomberg it basically is saying the following um, these aren't there aren't enough tourist arrivals to save the industry that used to contribute to one fifth of Thailand's economy Thailand's opening experiment during COVID-19 hasn't gone to plan and RK writes this guy here Randy um, explains from Beach Destination of Podcast. So let's watch what he has to say here. <clears throat> this is Patong Beach, which was one of the most popular beaches on the island before the pandemic. But looking at it now, it's almost deserted. Thailand has been closed to most visitors since late March, but is now starting to open its door to a small number of foreign visitors. The country has been doing experiments where they started accepting visitors on the condition. Randy's cute, huh? Randy's cute. Condition that they need to go through a 14-day quarantine inside a hotel room. And that's because it wants to strike a balance between keeping infection risks low for people living in Thailand and allowing some visitors to help some of its tourism businesses. The problem, though, is that at the moment, there aren't enough tourist arrivals to save the industry that used to contribute to about one fifth of Thailand's economy. Crazy, isn't it? How much tourism contributes to Thailand's economy and just crazy in general how important uh, tourism is to most nations GDP. Like, it's just maddening. And obviously, it must, you know, we just know how internationally connected we are. We are basically global citizens, even though it's a bit of a wanky term to use. But the reliance that these countries have with Eastern, with, you know, uh, tourists coming from all over the world to visit their country is greatly been, has been greatly sort of um, emphasized during this time of COVID. And one thing I've been wondering, I wonder if people's reluctance to go to Southeast Asia has anything to do with COVID. I wonder if this is kind of a odd xenophobic thing that's going to be um we might see ripple effects of going forward will like southeast asian companies ever rebound or countries ever rebound from this are there people out there who are purposely avoiding going to a southeast asian country because they fear getting covid in any short way or because of the demonization of the wet markets and stuff i wonder if that's a thing i'm sure I remember I remember a couple of times I heard somebody mention here in passing in the UK that they weren't ordering Chinese food, right? Because of COVID. And this was this was maybe around the summertime last year, right? When it was kind of everyone sort of uh, was fear mongering all over the place and people were panicking left, right and center. I haven't heard of that too much now going forward. But I wonder if there's been I wonder if you if you was to interview somebody that owned an Asian takeaway shop and ask them, Oh, has there been a 
inc- has there been a obvious decrease in terms of customers and changing of customers in general or losing of customers since COVID has struck, um, even with the lockdown? Because I'm sure there's some people who are still supporting the local restaurants, but I wonder if they can tell you, yep, yeah, I can definitely see a correlation between it. And maybe they're just never going to survive off the back of this. It'll be, it'll be horrible if so, because Southeast Asia is flipping beautiful. I've been to Bali um, and I really enjoyed my time there. Like, I'd love to go back again very, very soon. But um, yeah, I wonder if that's the case, if that's why people haven't gone or because if it's just primarily because of the um, long quarantine times are required to go. Who knows? Let's continue the video. I just landed in Phuket and the airport is quite empty considering December is usually one of the busiest periods for the island. It's usually the time when European travelers would come to spend several weeks on the beach. Now it's mostly just domestic travelers who come here for that weekend trip. And how wonderful is it to live somewhere in the Pacific where you can basically fly into Thailand for your winter break? or for a weekend trip how bloody beautiful that's something i realized quite quickly when we went to bali actually loads of australians loads of new zealand's new zealand people would kind of hop over just to, for a short little weekend getaway a little week getaway and that was essentially their version of ibiza or parts of greece or portugal or every place that we sort of kind of go and jump over when we we're sort of looking for a weekend break but god damn it i'd probably swap them the other way around if i could turn right this road just off Patong Beach used to be lined with restaurants and bars. Now most of the businesses are closed. Tourism is very important for Phuket where 90% of its economy depended on it. And foreign That's visitors crazy. contributed to the majority of those receipts. So without them, there's just not enough income for businesses. For our hotel from last year, we are run operating uh, occupancy over 80 and 90 percent but when we compare right now uh this month and next month we'll be have only 10 percent jesus christ imagine that drop off the occupancy rate during the same month last year was 80 to 90 and now it's 10 percent I've definitely heard that. I think I heard from a couple of podcasts I listened to with stand-up comedians. They mentioned that they went, you know, probably not allowed to go on tour and stuff in certain places. You're not allowed to leave your state depending on the mandate. But, you know, do you have to do to put food on the table? But I remember a couple of them mentioned that, yeah, when they checked into their hotels, they were told by people at the reception, like, they were the only ones staying on their floor sometimes or maybe in the entire hotel. Just imagine how mad that must be. You're flying into a major city. Of course, it's a major city because you're basically performing there. Um, and then you're staying in a very popular hotel, most likely. If you're, you know, you've got an agent and shit, they just hook you up with the most well-known and reliable hotel. And then you're going in there and you're the only one that's there because of a virus. Like, incredible. And then you just wonder, like, how do these places bounce back? Maybe they're getting gone for subsidies, but I just can't even try and wonder or speculate as to how a hotel of like that size you know 30 story 40 story whatever high it may be all these amenities in there how it's able to kind of function still as a business without having people coming in and paying per night or whatever it may be that they do like it's just mad isn't it and especially in Southeast Asia where a lot of the imagine for the workers this guy now spraying down the piece of the suitcase and stuff a lot of their money that they earn is basically through tips isn't it the people that pick up your car at the front, they take your luggage and shit. So all of that is effectively gone. Right now we have only Thai customers. Tourism businesses have said that mandatory quarantine is one of the key obstacles preventing visitors from coming to Thailand and they want it scrapped. They say that the majority of visitors that want to visit Thailand only stay for less than a week. So it's not practical for them to spend two weeks inside a hotel room during their vacation. But not everyone agrees with that proposal. A survey in October showed that the majority of Thais were against the tourism reopening plan. So the government has been trying to balance both sides, one pushing for a wider reopening for more tourists, and the other pushing for strict rules to minimize infection risks. And while it's true that once the majority of people got vaccinated, this debate of reopening with or without a quarantine will go away, the vaccine rollouts may take some time, and many of the businesses may not be able to hold off that mm. long without income from foreign tourists. 
So when the island fully reopened again, some of those businesses may already be gone forever. <sighs> that's like, again, that is one of the that's one of the things I don't envy about being somebody that's in office at the moment. Like, how do you balance those two things? Right. The needs of the nation you know, health wise, and then also the needs of the nation when it comes to tourism and economy, especially places like Phuket and, you know, in Thailand in general, where most of the people that are basically contributing to your GDP don't live there. They just fly in for a weekend or two. But of course, you want to keep your your population there healthy. And maybe this is the whole quagmire in place for people that are performing or putting on play graves, right? They're usually doing them in countries like Thailand where you can maybe i would say bribe but you can convince local officials here and there to allow you to do an event because they are hoping that by doing that event you're allowing the country to open up you're maybe showing tour international visitors from all around the world that they can come and visit your place safely you're obviously putting money back in their pocket and in your pocket so there's a weird ethical moral thing at play where it's obviously in some places it's kind of legal to do these parties but then it obviously isn't maybe the right thing to do at this time given what's going on in the world but again maybe that's a situation for somebody else to sort of deal with but again a definitely a hard one to come to grips with next on the list we have distressing news courtesy of russia alexei navalny um the obviously prominent critic of vladimir putin um or the opposition leader for the most part who was uh poisoned allegedly by some russian operatives who kind would who some people would argue was sent by putin um of course alexi definitely re regards that's the that's the that's what happened he somehow miraculously recovered in berlin i think his wife basically saved his life because i think they realized quite quickly that he was ill i think he fell ill on a plane and the plane then got uh, uh the plane then got emergency landed he got taken off the plane and, got, and gone got, he got taken off the plane sorry i think he was going to russia i'm pretty sure whatever the story is the russian government were basically denying him the ability to get an expert in or to get his own doctor in eventually through the persistence of his wife he eventually flew um out to berlin and to a specialist got treated they confirmed he was poisoned and he was on the mend he started obviously um going back and forth with his government and exposing some things and uncovering some truths he allegedly spoke to one of the operatives that was involved in his poisoning and it just seemed like he was going to for the most for the foreseeable future maybe be a critic of the russian government from afar which is you know fairly cool tactic to do considering that he has a very large youtube uh, channel and presence online um he seems to be a bit of a asian provocateur in that regard provocateur how oh, why, why did i say provocateur that way it doesn't matter regardless anyway you would assume he did that but all of a sudden out of nowhere he decided to go back home because he said you know i'm a citizen of russia i can go back I'm a, i should be allowed to go back to my home country he boarded a plane in berlin and decided to fly off to russia and on upon his landing he's now been taken to custody and from the last i know he's now been in jail he's going to be sentenced to jail for 30 days for breaking whatever law he's breaking and mm -hmm. um, that you know i guess the russian government made up but this is headline from bbc news it says lexi navalny uh poison putin critic navalny to be kept in custody so it says the following um russian's leading opposition figure has been arrested and detained for 30 days mr navani said that a court um, ruling held inside a police station was a mockery and calls for the street protesters yeah i saw the video he's legitimately being tried inside of a reception of a, of a police station that's how hastily and clumsily they did it or just you know just not even hasty and clumsily they just tried to get it over and down so they can put him to prison he um he was held soon after his flight from germany landed in moscow on sunday russian prosecutors say he violated the parole terms of a suspension the sentence for embezzlement he says the charges are politically motivated last august mr levani age 44 was almost killed in a nerve agent attack which he blamed personally on russia vladimir putin so last year was an absolute madness and it not only did covid ravage the entire world this random this random thing just occurred last year too in august that we suddenly just forgot about mad the, the kremlin denies involvement the opposition politician allegations have however been backed by reports from investigative journalists on sunday big crowds gathered at moscow's um volnotkov airport to greet mr navalny flight from berlin but in a last minute decision the authorities rerouted the plane to another airport in the capital yeah they didn't even tell anybody right so which was a very clever tactic something similar they did to me when i was protesting for you know the rise in tuition fees here in london they purposely just let all the protesters kind of 
you know, tired themselves out protesting outside the airport they thought he was flying into. Didn't let them know that it was going to get rerouted. They also didn't kind of leave because, you know, of course, if there's no danger um, being posed there, they could just obviously leave their station. They just stayed there acting like it was still happening. But little did they know he flew into another airport. Um, the makeshift coat co room sorry, was organized on Monday at police station in Kimik on the outskirts of Moscow, where Mr. Levani had spent the night. As you can see him get, getting pulled, uh, getting led astray, led out by the police officers, of course, with the cuffs there on show, clear sign to everybody else out there that, hey, if you come back, you're always going to get arrested. You're always going to get punished. Don't speak out against the government. Um, the judge ordered Mr. Levani in detention until the 15th of February for violating his parole. He will have to, he will have another hearing on the 29th of January to determine whether his suspended sentence for three and a half years should be replaced with a jail's term. Mr. Vanya said his treatment was beyond the mockery of justice and described the hearing as lawlessness of the highest grade. He said, don't be afraid, take to the streets, not for me, but for yourselves, for your future, he said in a video address in Russian from the police station. Amazing. Dozens of Navani supporters gathered outside the police station in freezing weather, demanding him to release. Mr. Vanya was soon later led away by police to one of Moscow's prisons. Mr. Vanya's lawyer, Vladimir um, Vladim Kobov, Kob, Kobozev said that they would be appealing the legal court decision required according to Russia's Interfax news agency. Of course, the immediate question that comes to mind is why would somebody like Lex Friedman want to be is so infatuated about interviewing Vladimir Putin and trying to find the best in him? It's so weird. His sort of love for Vladimir Putin is very, very bizarre. I think some sometimes I think like is he like an undercover psyop or something? Like is has he been placed within American podcasting society for him to kind of rewrite the narrative of Putin in some odd way? Because I don't really get his in fact I get I get his infatuation with Putin for the outside looking in. I've got books about the guy i've read a couple i've watched a couple of documentaries again you know i try and read as many articles as i can about everything that's going on over there but in terms of being in awe of him as a what did he call him as a i think he could relate to putin as a patriot and somebody that is fundamentally looking for the best in russia which what is killing random opposition uh, uh leaders in very dubious ways and denying all the men i think even the other day when they asked him in a town hall meeting putin about the actual allegations or that alexei said that basically he sent his agents vladimir putin said nah if we would have wanted him dead he would have been dead it's like god damn it that's not really a way to answer that kind of question is it so that's one thing i thought why does lex freeman want to interview putin and then if he does Will he ask him questions concerning his critics that have basically alleged that they've in some way, shape or form been poisoned, attempted to or have hits on them? Like, will he address that? Probably not. The second thing I was thinking, doesn't this whole fear to look somewhat engineered or manufactured? Doesn't this look a little bit too, not fake, but it just looks odd. Why would somebody who was just about to die who was, you know, again, pulled through by the skin of his teeth, why would they purposely put themselves in harm way like this if they weren't somehow imp somehow kind of put in power vis-a-vis -vis like a, an American secret service of some, of some sort in order to destabilize the Russian government? Is that a possibility? Could that possibly be a thing? It may be, who knows? But because it just seems a little bit too, the theatrics around it seem a little bit excessive, right? He was enjoying his life in Berlin for the most part, away from any kind of possibility of extradition. There was no real immediate threat to his life at in, at Germany. He uncovered allegedly the two officers who were responsible for poisoning him in the first place. Why would he then purposely go put himself in harm's way? He knew he wasn't going to be able to just walk around the streets of Moscow, you know, um, and live his life as per normal. He was always going to have a target on his back. Why would he do that? Does he love his country that much that he's willing to die and leave his wife or his fiance alone, his family members without their whatever? Like, especially having been so close to death, is it really worth that much to him? Or is it because he's been placed there as a person to cause, to kind of, you know, kick the hornet's nest? per se i wonder i really do wonder but anyway that's maybe a story for another day and i don't want to get sniper hit by you know some foreign spy from outside the window over there let's move on what's we'll you talk about here da, 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 da. oh this is a good one yes yeah, talk about prada so um prada put together their first co 
I guess, co-designed collection for menswear between Mikusia Prada and Raf Simmons. Raf Simmons, obviously, known as uh, one of the leaders and one of the most inspirational, um, yeah, inspirational menswear designers of his time, linking together with somebody like Mikusia Prada, who's kind of one of the most intellectual man, uh, designers of her time as well, for a collection that, in my opinion, was probably one of the best displays of outerwear that i've seen in a very very long time makes sense considering the price of two designers but god damn was this debut more than um everything that we've been hoping to kind of see from these two powerhouses coming together and it was absolutely sublime so many nice pieces in it um to kind of divulge in um of course this is courtesy of, uh vogue runway um, we'll read a couple of quotes here from the review, uh, a couple of paragraphs, sorry, it says the following, um, it's, a f uh, it's a feeling, at the same time we were very attracted to not working with during a narrative, during the post uh, show Q&A and then later on Zoom press conference, both Bakusha Prada and Raf Simmons emphasised that these collections um, design was intended to stir sensations rather than signal some storyline, that was one significant departure from the first co-createdly um, co -createdly directed mental collection or offered by the two in staging, setting, music, decoration and more. Past Prada shows have often featured reverse engineered clues obliquely telling easter eggs that allow a reading to unfold and of course that's what you get with these two heavy hitters isn't it? Um, a lot of from what I've seen so far of the fashion of course that I've been following a lot of it kind of follows a narrative a theme of some regard you kind of like design around and you sort of your collection is basically your attempt to display and illustrate the world that that theme encapsulates but I've found that the top head the top 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 designers for the most part it just comes out of the it just comes out of thin air they're just able to sort of like take an idea and somehow be able to distill it or ideate it across you know 20 plus looks into accessories and this more lucky for just one point it doesn't necessarily have to be a theme it could be a color it could be a sound it could be a phrase it could be a uh, a feeling and that's really what they do at the top level and again it's it's unfair because there's something that a lot of people can kind of copy or emulate at all because it just feels like it's something you have or you don't have. Uh, the second paragraph here says, Today, instead, we saw a men's collection dominated by a garment that acted as a single motif that could, depending on your feeling, be worn, felt, and seen in multiple ways. The garment was a knit pattern long john above the foundation of a model wearing it. A long john was the cladding upon which every look in the show was constructed, although sometimes that look went unadorned or long john. Um, no one long john. Uh, no one long john was the same no one long john was the same so the patterns were sometimes art deco sometimes adapt argyle uh, adapted argyle sometimes else so sometimes something else necklines varied from turtle to v to polo to round yarns and ply spanned mohair fine gauge shetland and more so let's come on to the pictures here and again like i said just outwear heavy to the teeth and just another ex another illustration as to why i always think the best menswear collections whether they're streetwear whether they're fashion always in my opinion start with four you don't get good menswear in spring I, I just don't think and that's the difference I think fundamentally with my idea where I always say I think men can be stylish but I don't think they could be fashionable because I think women's fashion definitely exists um probably at its highest level in spring and maybe sometimes also in fall but men's only lives in fall in terms of coats and jackets and jumpers and trousers and big pants and whatever it may be that's where it kind of exists and it's hard to be fashionable with those big sturdy garments right i feel fashionable you can kind of be a little bit more is when it's stuff is a bit more loose and you can just kind of throw on top of a model and pull here and tighten there um but again that's a story for another day but again uh, this little styling detail which i don't think i'm not sure if it's a styling detail or a feature of the actual jacket maybe there's a some sort of uh pulley or string in there that allows you to pull it but i love that little detail here where you're sort of like pulling up the cuffs and exposing um this tight knit on the inside that was of course brilliant let's continue here got the same one there too same there too of course this is the long john thing featured in the actual um review that they were speaking about the set design is absolutely lush who the, who did the soundtrack was it rishi horton or somebody somebody electronic did the soundtrack i saw it 
on my feed briefly i don't know who it was but if you know let me know in the comments but yeah just utterly utterly beautiful man and then of course the coats and the standout piece that everyone's sort of talking about on the on the timeline with the gloves on his pockets but the coats themselves were just so well done you had that kind of boxy um oversized proportions that you know and love from raf but also that kind of exquisite tailoring where it sort of looks like it just fits you like a glove that again that i will always say kind of occupies the higher levels of fashion where they can take like a simple pea coat a simple double-breasted jacket and just elevate it to a level where it sort of looks like the thing that you're used to seeing every single day but it's definitely got a bit of a twist and that's what you see more so at the highest level i feel like sometimes that's why probably a lot of people have a lot of bad things to say about these new designers when they come in especially into the game they probably try too many tricks and they, they probably go a bit too crazy with everything and they think like, you know the biggest the brightest the most wackest design is basically going to win um and then also they have the tendency to not being able to really make a mundane item such as a trench coat look elevated or look somewhat luxurious as some of the better designers are and again i don't know what that is i'm not sure if that's a training thing or if that's just a innate talent but there is this difference between how somebody like a raf simmons or musha prada designs uh a simple kind of knit jumper and however else you know you can kind of name there's just levels to it um and then of course the detail with these leather um gl gloves with the bags that first came into what into the collective consciousness i'm gonna say it was that collection where everyone looked like they came from the adams family was that 2017 right where they had all the crazy hair and the big boots that all the girls are wearing nowadays that's the first time we saw these sort of pockets that kind of usually adorn the outside of the boot now they've been kind of plopped onto the side of uh onto the top i guess your your top of your hand sort of side on the leather glove i wonder if they're going to be detachable because i know for the boots you can detach them you've got like a little um strap that sort of like ties them on the back uh but i wonder if they can detach from the actual glove and i also wonder pricing wise well how much they're gonna end up being they're probably gonna end up being bucks and a half but it's such a clever clever piece of an accessory an easy thing that's going to be seen on editorials all over the place and something that will sell very very easily of course depending on the price by something people will pay for it doesn't matter because those boots for instance they're like three thousand pound aren't they with all the pockets in them and they've been selling like absolute hotcakes so much so that there's fakes on alibaba all over the place now and other um what are they called pretty little things type of shops they have kind of they've copied that boot style already so i can imagine this being kind of copied from loads of different brands too um so that was cool and of course the ability to store some indiscriminate things in that pocket you know on your way out um let's continue here and of course the colors are always beautiful um i love this twist on the classic bomber jacket you know this is i always say there's too many bomber jackets on the market and then you see another bomber jacket made by a designer of a high caliber and you're like i need this right this is just sublime um an oversized bomber jacket with this amazing print that you still see on the long johns i'm assuming um featured here on the waistband on the cuffs with the pocket here on the side just lovely done beautifully done sorry lovely done but you know what i mean just gorgeous 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 of course another illustration of the bomber jacket of the overcoat great pants there and then this coat whatever this one is this double breasted coat is one of my favorites look at the buttons it's got the same sort of like motif that you see the little badge the upside down triangle that's featured on the bag on the print of the actual buttons like so good um it continues here I've got the same jacket in gray <sighs> that whatever material that is is beautiful i'm assuming it's leather um you've got again sweats the knit the cardigans you of course got the long johns of course here staple for as mentioned in a review the colors and the tones of everything are gorgeous and again this leather jacket this but again another bomber jacket and i'm assuming it's leather which looks beautiful with the gloves with the pockets on the outside just so so well done even the shoes look rather interesting these little derby uh platformy type shoes look very nice derby dress shoes in purple again the same jacket and i think my favorite look is this coming up here with the bag underneath the shoulder underneath the armpit this is 100 my favorite look like that it just looks so good 
that's look number 31 in case you just listen to the podcast you've got this i'm not sure if it's piles i don't know what what that material is on that jacket but whatever material that is it's sort of just over knee length material um big massive buttons here on the front i'm assuming with the logo there you've got the pockets at the right length too which is another underrated aspect of coats from luxury brands they always seem to have the pockets in the right place for you to kind of rest your hands in and not feel like you're kind of constrained by the jacket and you've got this nice bag here on the inside of the arm it looks like a little leather backpack with maybe some uh bits of core prada hardware there and then of course you've got the same look with the sort of shorter jacket kind of just above knee length it looks like so just beautifully done great bits of styling great color combination and color blocking you of course that little styling tip there with the sleeves pulled up might be something you'll see i, I, I was gonna say in street style looks but you there's no street style at the moment but regardless yeah see it's got the detail but i definitely think it's a cool little detail there what's up in the nails the tips painted what's up what's up with nails there? No, it's not um but yeah it looks brilliant man what a debut was it a debut is it the first one i did the first one before i don't know regardless it's it's, it's lovely ref simmons and prada uh combined menswear show definitely one of my favorites and then it made me think uh about my all-time favorite ref simmons or all-time favorite prada collection which made me think about the greatness of mikusha prada was this from 2010 for menswear 2010 was my favorite because i remember listening or reading an interview or something about mikusha prada and someone said something like oh whenever she's designing she always starts from one point of reference and it's always about things that she's not into right she purposely designs clothing for stuff that she doesn't care about because it allows i think something like she likes being detached from it and not being too overly invested in the things she's designing for and supposedly this is obviously maybe a reference to the corporate world to the kind of you know it, I, I, i'm not too sure if this collection 2010 came out during the whole take ivy resurgence remember when everyone was trying to dress like a ivy league student from the 70s and that massive take ivy book was popular and japanese brands were you know, sh you know high putting out magazine after magazine with different scans of various people from those years gone by wearing this sort of like you know um geography teacher outfit with the sweatshirt underneath a blazer uh a pair of loafers and slacks and stuff do you remember that that was a whole period i'm not too sure if that was a thing but regardless this is definitely easily one of my favorite collections of all time this kind of um opened my eyes to the greatness of prada um that loved the proportions the shrunken uh mohairish type uh jumpers there on the inside the the slight flare on the bottom of the slacks the amazing loafers with the kind of exaggerated tassel on the front just beautiful and this digi camera sort of like this kind of you know whatever you'd call that camera print i remember that was the first i, I think that might be one of the first proper runway pieces that i seen in real life because you know i don't get to go to shows i don't necessarily hang out with fashion people so you don't get to see this stuff actually being worn and i remember i got the train it might have been a northern line somewhere and i saw an asian lady wearing one of the coats that was featured in this collection it might have been the purplish one let me just go through some of the looks here but oh so beautiful this whole thing man it's so gorgeous loads of browns yellows warm colors and look at that look at that look look 15 so good i'd wear the hell out of that outfit man it's absolutely amazing and it looks so modern now it still it doesn't look like something that came out what 10 years ago if that right so great and i remember i saw somebody look at this look I, I i think i saw a lady i'm gonna say it was a jacket like that but it was a yellowy type of uh camo print let me see if i can find it yeah i think it was coming up here it was like yeah i think it was one it's like a yellowy greeny yeah there it was i think it was this color i saw a lady wearing it on a train that color of a coat i was like wow yeah i think that made my favorite look of the entire thing 37 all black you got this amazing cardigan with a belt uh fastening here on, on the waist uh what do you call that a deep neck o neck sort of like sweatshirt that doesn't look like something you buy at zara it's a level above but just look at the entire thing it just looks mad good in it yeah i think it was one of these coats that i saw some lady wearing on the train it was definitely one of the camera ones for sure i was like fuck me it made my eyes pop out of my head i'm sure she recognized it as well and look at that look at the neck fastening you got is that what do you call that is that like an o 
um in closing you see that a lot on like what what was those shirts um not Kafka, i don't know what that shirt is Phoebe Fire did that a lot what's that I don't know it's called something whatever that finishes on the cuff on the cuff what am I talking about whatever that thing is anyway it's not cuffs it's where the yeah, next pops out but I love that shape but yeah um, Prada for 20, 2010 one of my collections four favourite collections of all time probably favourite from Mikusha Prada herself anyway and definitely goes to show her level of greatness but yeah that was definitely a standout from this week um so far do, 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 do. what else do we have here mm. what else do i want to talk about before i leave you guys oh yeah let's talk about this quickly where is it let's see if i can get it Mm-mm. there we go cool so i mentioned previously in another podcast that i'm a little bit on a podcast might be on open tabs definitely make sure you check out my show open tabs it's like a live stream show that i put together um usually you know i do them whenever i have some time but i basically live stream and go through some open tabs mainly i'm going to try and make sure i keep them to video content so it's a bit mixed um i mix up a bit from the stuff that i talk about on the podcast but definitely check out open tabs available on my channel get on there now anyway um so I mentioned in another show that I wasn't that optimistic about the future of dance music, right? I was kind of thinking, ah, oh, you know what? Things are going to change. Things are going to be exactly the same because I feel like there's a lot of patterns we're still seeing now, even with the whole playgraves, right? Most playgraves are usually being, um, are usually, cont- yeah, most playgrave lineups have the same old names and faces that you see prior to the whole playgrave thing kicking off. They were the ones that were basically, uh, basically, um, described under the business techno moniker right they're the same people that are now playing these uh parties that they probably shouldn't be playing at flying to locations they probably shouldn't be going to all under the guise of kind of making sure people are dancing cool whatever it may be but i felt like the lineups and the people that go into these events have basic an illustration as to maybe not how broken the industry is but how fragmented it is and it's just certain things are just going to be the way they are because they're the way they are and those people who are willing to fly to all across the side of the world to go and play places are usually the ones that sell the most tickets so because they sell the most tickets promoters are going to keep booking them and events and lineups won't really change that much going forward but I'm kind of optimistic about it because in my thought randomly about um, how Bergheim handled the whole Black Lives Matter movement when obviously um, George Floyd was unfortunately killed by the hands of police uh, during that, you know, unfaithful evening where he was, you know, effectively freaking out a bit, you know, judge, judging by the um, body cam footage, but he just didn't deserve to die in that manner in any way, shape or form. And when those unfortunate events sort of like rolled out and were spread across the world, everyone kind of took action in different ways. People did some of those kind of wanky black squares and stuff, but for the most part, black um, Bergheim were pretty quick to shut doors and to also make sure that they did this sort of performative display of solidarity where they initially uh, boarded up the entire front door of the Burkhain complete black and then had the list of in memory of Black Lives Matter lost the racist police violence at uh, United States in Germany. They had a list of people who unfortunately died at the hands of police, right? And they're kind of listed here, say their names, a complete list of people, right? Really, really touching, I thought at the time, poignant display of solidarity to people who were going through things that, you know, maybe your average clientele at Bergheim probably doesn't give a fuck about, right? They just want to go and dance and rave and do their thing. And then it got me thinking about how in general, Bergheim seems to handle things in a very classy way, right? I think about even the backlash they got with all the st- with the stamps and the re-entry shit, but for the most part, they seem to handle stuff pretty well and they seem to address things behind the scenes as they're meant to be addressed as opposed to doing performance stuff on social media. And then it made me think about, okay, if that's the case and Bergheim have looked, about, looked at as like the thought leaders and the sort of touch point and the kind of cultural leaders i'd get i guess right most you know most major markets in europe have tried to copy one element of how the bergheim is run obviously it does sometimes with very levels of success but they seem to be the people that everyone seems to copy if that's the case and if they're the ones doing that then there's a feeling that i have that they might reopen and decide to do something amazing where they just sort of say hey we're going to revamp our lineup we're committed to having 
this amount of people on our lineup from these these backgrounds we're committed to promoting these voices we're permit we're committed to putting on a particular night during the week that is specifically for pro providing a platform for people that aren't representative unrepresented sorry in dance music where it's lgbtq trans certain people for certain races whatever it may be i have a feeling that they're going to do that again this is just from my uh, just kind of intuition from what i basically saw them do last year at the height of the racial tensions around the world and just how they've kind of conducted themselves so far i've not really heard of any sort of wrongdoings between now and then the, the most craziest thing to happen is a fire that wasn't even at the main building right there's been no real misstep from them and i kind of feel like the people that are involved in the behind the scenes are kind of clued in and they kind of know what the long game is about and if this is a real issue that needs to be addressed i feel like the only way it will be addressed is for the people at the top who are sort of leading things to just put the changes in place and then unfortunately the promoters that don't want to take the risk will just have to take it because everyone sort of expects that from them they're just going to copy and follow suit um and then of course this married up with people on the ground level smaller promoters doing kind of their thing going out of their way to of course do you know their own little parties put on their own little nights i think that's going to really help as well going forward oh, how i missed that door so much but anyway um it's going to help a lot as well going forward but i definitely do think in the future we will see burger and the pattern robot do something in terms of representing unrepresented voices within dance music that will then lead to everybody else copying and lead to then a systemic change that we've probably never seen before that's my optimistic point of view i don't know if it's true if it's not but i do have a feeling that might happen in 2021 going forward especially with the vaccine and things opening up pretty soon i think there's going to be a need for things to reopen of course but also a need for all those promises that were made last year to be somehow put into action and there's no better person to to do it or no better institution than the church that is also known as Burkine. That's my opinion, but who knows? On the list as well, let's move on here. What else do we have? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's do another. This is this one. This is the last one to do it. Yeah. So this is courtesy of Shade Room. Um, one of my favorite UK artists, Emma Hunter, unfortunately got himself in a bit of a pickle where allegedly one of his um people in his circle leaked a video, um, essentially unmasking him. Right? Because Emma Hunter is one of those artists in the UK who dons a mask for privacy reasons. Um. And it's been pretty adamant throughout his entire journey that the whole reason why he puts a mask on is so that he can go and do and conduct his life as per normal. He has aspirations to sort of maybe leave the limelight behind and become a bit of an exec behind the scenes. And, you know, he just generally values his privacy more than being famous, which is all well and good. And I think for the most part in the UK, maybe less so, maybe if in the US would be different, but you do have a feeling we, don't, we tend to leave people alone for the most part who want to be left alone. Um, I think the the era of like you know the sun destroying certain celebrities lives has kind of gone maybe there is an aspect of it still with social media but there isn't that kind of further desire to kind of know the ins and outs of every single person that you kind of look or that you see on tv or here on the radio if they don't really want to talk to the press and they're kind of private you sort of lead them to their own devices as long as the music is good you don't really ask too many questions and for the most part i'm is probably one of the best artists that we have here in the uk all around um you know from rapping straight up to singing uh, melodies to his you know beat selection he's just one of the best he's probably one of my favorites and somebody that i can't wait to see live once the world reopens so this kind of unfortunate story obviously was um shared on you know various uh, uk blogs it says the following a friend of dutch valley allegedly responsible for leaked uh, video of m honcho so that's a new development so this video comes out leaks all over the internet he's gone viral everyone knows what m honcho looks like and immediately when i saw it i was just like this is bullshit i'm not going to look at this in it because i respected of course the artist's uh choice to remain anonymous and i didn't really understand why everyone was so some people were so desperate to see what he actually looked like of course i get the secrecy and the illusion of it all um, is one thing but when somebody goes out of the way to tell you hey i just want to live my life in privacy why don't just let them do it that doesn't happen it gets leaked it is what it is and then people are wondering who would leak something like that who would in dutch of, in sorry in in Montreal circle would be that much of an idiot to kind of jeopardize their position within the crew and obviously their overall safety just for a couple of likes and retweets on social media 
then of course this headline comes out about it allegedly being a friend of Dachavelli's, which makes sense because earlier on in the year or last year actually Dutch of course got himself involved in a bit of a scandal with the alleged nonce gate situation and i guess m honcho was one of the only people it felt like hmm, i guess prominent artists that came out um and equivocally without really mentioning dutch's name and basically was you know kind of demolished ad, ad, don, ad, admonished him for the alleged uh, crimes that he did or did not do according to the mom or the sister or the brother whoever you believe in the story and um I guess Dutch Avelli's crew didn't take too kindly to that. So they decided one of the people in his crew, so allegedly this guy here on the left, decided to leak the video of, of uh, M. Honcho as a sort of reminder that you shouldn't talk ill of pedos in public. I don't know what it was, but regardless, whatever he intended to do did the complete opposite from what I feel like. So this is uh, from um, Shade Borough. It said, the friend of Dutch Avelli allegedly responsible for leaked video of M. Honcho. The caption said, the man responsible for the leaked footage of M. Honcho identity without the mask is said to be a very close friend of the rapper Dutch Avelli. The video, which is circulating on social media, revealed M. Honcho's face whilst in the studio with some friends. Marv took to his Instagram stories to defend himself, saying that he didn't do it for clout. Imagine saying you didn't do something like that for clout. That is a personification of clout. You standing like that, right, with your thumbs and your jeans next to Steph London and Dutch Avelli like that is clout, right? The whole thing is clout. <laughs> but hey, what can you do? Uh, let's, let's see what you have to say. Um, he says, nope, M. Honcho ain't innocent. I'm not, uh, ain't innocent, nothing. Screenshot here said, hold on, wait a minute. And then he posts a screenshot here showing uh above it it says see be careful what you're saying i don't miss nothing and in a screenshot you've got uh, a caption with a mantra that says track louis vuitton lost hope of the dna mixtape and then um someone comments underneath that and says have you made a track with a nonce allegedly uh kind of pointing to dutch and he says i did i have any knowledge of that at the time question mark did you have any knowledge of that at the time question mark or did you find out last week right so I, again this doesn't make any sense because if that's the case if that's the reason why he decided to upload a video of m Joe's face he didn't even say nothing bad about the guy right he just basically said i didn't know nothing about the situation keep moving but underneath it, it says um snatchy is always trying to get a a gig riding is no form of transportation this is the following screenshot here. The funny thing is, I never did this for clout. It's obviously clout. This is, why else would you do this if you're one of Dutch and Betty's boys who no one knew, right? No one knew you as outside of the situation. Now, all of a sudden, you're plotted all over the place. Even I'm covering you, right? And I'm a nobody, but now you're somebody. <laughs> of course, it's just for clout. Um, so, because simply I don't need to. You funny little super groupies are creepy and weird to me. I can enjoy the music without being a super fan. LOL, I give zero shits about the industry. If you know, then you know. I step down from two up down because I don't really on this running around all day, every day, 24 7. That's the truth. So, you're lazy and you just want to get likes and retweets on social. Cool, makes sense. No one gives a shit about clout. That's when you're involved. When you mention clout two times in one screenshot, of you writing words and probably you love clout um to be involved in the world of insta which is not real that's what happened when the truth is no one wants to be trolled okay again it's, it's, it's interesting just how little sense some of these people make when they actually try and write words down in it it's very interesting especially the hangers on they you know they always standing next to pictures smiling you know enjoying the riches of their way more talented and successful friend and in the moment they get the chance to speak for themselves you realize why they don't speak more often in it you realize it continues here and what i've proved today is everyone is happy to have their say dare say okay uh grandma there but hey who cares and say their piece until you flip the same attention onto them then it's a problem use your platforms wisely so he's trying to basically say because that m hunter was willing to come out and say something about an alleged nonce now somehow he's feeling uncomfortable about having his face revealed that he didn't want to be revealed. like this doesn't make any sense like again this is this logic is weird and say their piece that the uh clout you know is rolling eyes emoji this industry is fake to me no one is friends in music because you're all in competition with each other which is true but you know if you're in competition with a nonce you've probably won already if you're not a nonce in it right if if a nonce if a nonce and a non-nonce have a race who wins 
the non-nons all the time. I don't care if you're faster. The non-nons always wins because, you know, by the time you cross the line, you're probably going to get your head kicked in, isn't it? I'd imagine. I don't know. Um, it's all about who does the biggest uh, number, who had the most streams, who's getting all the awards. Uh, you're getting for the guy uh, uh, who's getting all the awards. You're the guy on the phone will ring. a and will be circling like sharks that smell blood, making all types of promises, surrounded with all fake artists who now want to be your friend because you're the guy holding the torch. If you're popping and I'm popping, let's hang around you together. La, hello or nah, I'm good where I am. Speak my mind. I don't live in fear. You can't troll me because I don't give a shit. I try to be, I try to, but I just can't because all the wave surfing, but everybody is trying to be on a surfboard. Bruv, did this guy... Did this guy drop out of school in year six or something? Jesus Christ, bro. Um, so I guess he's basically trying to say that everybody that was that's his friend prior to the allegations all jumped off and they were all then circling like snakes trying to take his position because it felt like he was a wounded animal. Effectively, his career is somewhat over, isn't it, Dachavelli? As much as I like the guy, and you know, you shouldn't be condemned due to just allegations alone, the evidence is pretty alarming isn't it about the whole nonscape thing even if he didn't do it especially again the issue he has with dutch i guess there's a lot more it's less i don't know why in the uk yeah you as you say less because you look what happened to six nine he had that underage girl thing and he kind of got away with it there seems to be it's a way bigger taboo in the uk to be involved in anything involving minors at all in any way shape or form it doesn't really matter like you if you have just a hint of that smudge in your name is pretty difficult to ever get it off. So with Dutch Avelli obviously being a prominent rap star and it being something very uncommon, you definitely hear from a kind of the quote unquote rap hip hop community. It's just going to always stick on him. And unfortunately for good or for worse. So to somehow suggest that people that were his friends prior jumping off the wave are what looking for clout, they're snakes, they're sharks or rats, whatever it may be called. That's not necessarily fair, in it? Because what do you expect them to do? Do you expect people to come out unequivocally and say that they don't think he is a nonce when they don't know? And then have it be proved that he is and then have that smudge on their name? It's just not worth it. It really isn't. There's enough There's enough artists out there for you to kind of co-sign in back and stand in videos around and pop balls and clubs with. You don't need to kind of uh, hitch your entire ride on the Dutch Valley train because sooner rather than later, unfortunately, it's probably going to come to a grinding halt because, you know, all the brands and companies are going to know that, you know, that smudge is very, very difficult to get off you once it's on you. Um, another screenshot here said let's stop using dutch as a power move to get your name out there to start trending it's not funny you see when i start doing it back when you then you see it from your point then it's no then that then it's why me in it bruv what are you talking about you standing up for your friend is one thing cool but then revealing someone's face because what they decided to distance themselves from your friend is completely different this kind of backwards logic to explain shitty behavior is very unpleasant to read and watch. Um, it says, I'm not the one, I'm not with the online trolling at all, trying to bring another man down because all I want to know, like, if I fit in, don't be a sheep. The people who have made up their minds safe, the people who don't believe safe, but I'm seeing this cancel thing getting out of control. The truth always comes to light. Yeah, it does. But in this case, what's the truth, though? What can be explained from the mess that was? Again, this is a lot of kind of like, um, uh, this is a lot of... Uh, abdication of responsibility it feels like right because effectively dutch is the one that got himself this issue in the first place he didn't handle the allegations well when they first kind of went viral right he didn't address it in the right way he was coming out on this bully boy thing bad man thing i'm gonna beat you up if i see you blah, 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 right which is understandable maybe behind the scenes he was hearing about the snakes and the people circling around trying to get him dropped from his label i don't know let's just say he was justified in that rage but at that time he should have been a bit more collected and gathered his thoughts properly spoken to his peoples whoever it may be involved and got together a coherent story that could that could somehow explain the situation but because they came out with three or four different storylines, the mum is trying to draw him on via, you know, the the niece's flipping account. Uh, the some images were de deleted. The hacker um, purposely screenshotted the wrong things and make him look one way. There were so many different narratives coming out at once. Then the sisters got involved. Two of both of them. I didn't know he had two sisters. Um, I know obviously Stefan Don is his sister, but he's got another sister that looks like her. She got involved. Like it was madness that came out all at one time. That was his fault. 
And then by the time they got their story straight or whatever the story was, it was too late. The narrative has already been made and especially in the internet and social media, whatever you have to do from what I've little I've learned of keeping abreast of these people from the outside looking in, you have to dictate the narrative at all times. When the narrative starts to deviate away from you, you have to rein that thing back in again. You can't let it go out of control. And then, you know, when people like IMDBB come out and start talking indirectly about you and it starts gathering pace and then people start to, you know, that who's that guy? That manager guy, bouncer, bully, bouncer, bacon, whatever his name is, he came out and said something like it was just a madness. It was already too gone. So this whole idea that somehow these artists are the ones that were the ones responsible for the cancel culture is not really true. You kind of let people cancel you because you made it seem as if like you were guilty. The whole going to Dubai thing in the middle of it, it was just odd. It was all odd, but hey, who, who knows? He continues. With that being said, let it come to light. And if you want to start bantering, man, be able to hold the banter back or just don't get involved. I don't think being accused of pedophilia is banter. And also don't think um, people exposing your identity online when you don't want to be exposed, essentially ducks in your face. That isn't really banter, in it? That's not really my form of banter, I would say. But hey, and of course, you've got a picture here of Amonja's face and him being number trending on Twitter. So again, an incredible shit show of a situation. And like I said, it hasn't really helped because look at this video. This is a video here from uh, Shadebar as well. It's an image of Stefan Dunn takes on the Buster Challenge. Of course, you're all familiar with the challenge on social media. And, you know, she looks fairly attractive, you know, fairly attractive here. A very good looking girl wearing a great outfit to begin with, doing the whole thing, deciding to do the Buster Challenge and then change it to something spectacular, right? And then obviously doing the action really, really good, right? Twerking and stuff and shaking her booty and doing all the good stuff. So in theory, this is a fairly entertaining video that should just live on its own. But look at the comments. So all that exposing of him Hunter's face, look at the comments, it's undone nothing. The, look at the first one. Didn't expect much from a colorist predator enabler and still disappointed somehow. Another one. She was better before. Okay, that's good. Uh, bust it all you want, but your brother won't bust his case, right? Already. So all this stuff, just 3,679 likes. So all this stuff that they're trying to do to distract everyone from um, the allegations against him aren't working. And if anything, they're solidifying in people's brains that he's 100% guilty, even if he might not be. So this is the issue that they have here. Like, it's just like it's such a shitty way to go about things, especially for somebody, someone like, especially if, especially exposing someone like M. Honcho, who from my experience looks like he's one of the rare people who get posted on these pages who kind of is universally loved. Everyone seems to have a good thing to say about him whenever he kind of, they post interview clips from of his or him doing a freestyle. There's always good comments. People actually like M. Honcho. So you go after somebody who's effectively the people's champ and then you try and use, you try and kind of expose him in an effort to, what, valid, validate your position, but then it ends up uh, having uh, having worse influence or ha the consequences end up being worse for you. And then they end up being an after effect felt by people next to you who aren't involved in the situation at all, vis-a-vis hey, -vis your sister. Look, it says here, yeah, it's pretending to drink for me. She says, why are people still being posted? Uh... Her fang was dangin. I was waiting Dutch of a to show up in the background. Like 380. She's a colorist. So I don't know the colorist thing too. I haven't read that problem. I don't know what's going on there. Um, um, she's a colorist. So stop forcing her down her throat. She needs to be um, bust her heart to heart with her brother, non Savelli. We ain't forgot. Hashtag. So again, like all these tactics, all these approaches they're trying to do in terms of effectively trying to silence people through this exposing thing it hasn't necessarily worked it's backfired in a major way and it's unfortunate too because it feels like Dasha Valley's career has effectively been cancelled it feels like by himself right he kind of fucked it over himself as much as he wants to blame everybody else it's effectively done it feels like everyone's always going to have something to say about those allegations and those individual stories now you'd hope once the world reopens people forget he would hope his group that's what probably they'll be thinking in you know behind closed doors once the world reopens and he's on stage again it, you can probably forget about it but i don't know man like the uk is again we're so sensitive about stuff involving kids it just doesn't seem like a certain thing people just conveniently forget about you know um especially considering how weird it all transpired uh but hey maybe i'm wrong i'd love to know your thoughts and opinions below what do you think do you think dutch's career is completely done um are you uh concerned or bothered about m honcho's uh, face reveal and yeah just what go what happens from now going on let me know in your comments 
or your thoughts exactly in the comments down below. Anyway, that's the Angus English Show, episode number 423. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your time. If it's your first time, check out the show. Make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share it with your friends. I'd be more than appreciated. And of course, if you want to support the show via Patreon, please do. It's patreon.com for just Agostino. Patreon.com for just Agostino. I'm going to be uploading one bonus episode per month on the Patreon website only for my Patreon backers. So make sure you jump on there. Patreon.com for just Agostino. Patreon.com for just A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. For little as $1 per month, you get access to my entire library as well as those bonus shows only on Patreon. Make sure you sign up on there today. But until next time, my friends, take care be safe and i'll see you guys again very soon peace